Hello guys, Yen146 here. Welcome to today's video. So, uh, first of all, um, I just finished playing a, a 10 board Simon and that was open to 12 of Ghana chess. We had a, an interesting uh, Simon. I, 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 I won 5 boards and lost on 5 boards, so I guess it wasn't too terrible <laughs> at least not as terrible as I had expected I fully expected to lose half the games on time in the other half of position um, so it, it went quite well unfortunately although we planned to record that that um, Simon and upload it as a video um, I only realized at the end that apparently the, the video stopped recording about a minute or two into the Simon itself so yeah in the heat of the moment I, I, I didn't realize it while playing so at the end I was going to stop the stream and then I realized that uh, it wasn't recording at all. So that's that's a pity. So unfortunately we couldn't get the video up. But uh, we'll play many more Simons and so we'll, we'll definitely get a bunch of those videos in. Um, so this is the next part in our planning in the video game series. Um, this is the lesson on space. A very mysterious entity of space. In this video we're going to consider what space is, what it means in chess. How to identify a position where there's an imbalance in space. Um, general principles that guide us when we play on either side of such a position, whether we have the advantage or the disadvantage in space. And then we'll look at two example games of how two very strong players played on either side of, of having the extra space. So we'll look at both the advantages and disadvantages of this imbalance. So let's get right into it. What is space? It's one of the concepts that is Maybe it takes some time to get familiar with, but then at the lower levels, it's not something that many people think about. But then as you get stronger, you realize it's it's fairly important. Basically, it refers to the territory under your control. When you start a chess game, both white and black control two ranks, and the middle of the board is yet to be determined. Yeah, but then as the pawns, the pawns and the pieces move out, you realize that the pawns will form some sort of line or structure. So you have pawns here here maybe here um, and the line of pawns will basically help you see how much territory you control as white or black and basically that is space the amount of territory on the board that you, you control now you can look at the line of pawns that you have to determine who has more space you can also take a look at the central squares as a as a sort of a shortcut, either these four central squares or by extension this bigger square and look at how much territory either side, each side controls of this territory if someone controls significantly much more of it than the opponents, they probably have more space now you could have space, more space either in the center on either of the three, the three sides of the board, on the king side or on the queen side typically Having more space in the center is more valuable because, of course, the center is the center and it's the most important part of the chessboard. But then, having space, more space on the flanks can also be important, but then, usually, only if the center is blocked. So, if the center is blocked with some static bone structure, there are no bricks in the center, then having more space on the flanks becomes very important as well. But then, if the center is open, then you are usually uh, better off looking for more space in the center now let's look at the general principles that should guide us when we are playing with and against more space when we are playing with more space one of the basically what, what it means is because you control more territory you have more choices you have more squares under your control you can put your pieces on better squares because you control more of the board so you can basically build much better pieces than the opponent can the opponent tends to be cramped it controls much less of the board and so the first key is to avoid unnecessary exchanges of pieces when you have more space the opponent already has little space to maneuver in and so you, you let him um, figure his own problems out he's cramped so you don't want to exchange pieces and give him less pieces to put in the small space that he has but then you try to emphasize how cramped his position is so you avoid exchanges unless of course it's absolutely necessary or it gives you some other form of advantage so that's the first key 
you tend to avoid unnecessary exchanges. Um, you position your pieces on the ideal squares. When you control more of the board, you have more time to do that. You will see that in the example games that we, we look at. And when you, you develop basically a better position because you have better pieces than your opponent, you can target the weak point in your opponent's camp and attack it. And because they have worse pieces than you, you will tend to stand better in any complications that follow in such positions. So we'll look at our first example game. You see how former world champion Capablanca made use of these principles very expertly in winning this game against Mr. Trebal. But then how do you play against the um, space advantage? Now, the interesting thing about pawns is that they can't go backwards. And of course you know this, but then it has certain repercussions on the chest. But what it means is that whenever a pawn moves forward, it relinquishes control of certain squares. Yeah. If this D, D pawn should move D2 to D4, these two squares that it controlled on the D2 square, it can't control any longer. And these two squares that it could have controlled on the D3 squares again, it cannot control any longer. So the, the more you move your pawns forward and grab more space, the more squares you leave behind them that the pawns cannot control. And these are the same squares that become outposts, that become weaknesses for your opponent. So more space also means possibly more weaknesses if you are not you don't advance your pawns carefully and so when you are playing against the space you try to look out for these weaknesses and attack them of course like we mentioned um, on the having the space side you, you also want more exchanges when you're on the side playing against the space advantage because you have less bases to fit in your current space so exchanges tend to help you so you look out for exchanges to reduce your current position um, you look for pawn breaks you look for ways to make use of the weaknesses that the person with the space has left behind and again we we'll look at the second game where coach noy to coach noy as black also makes excellent use of these very principles in defeating an opponent that just went haywire grabbing as much space as possible so those are the principles. Now let's go through our example games and see how the the experts make use of these principles. So this is Jose Raul Capablanca in the first game playing white against one Mr. Karel Trebal. Now this game is very popular, fairly popular because of how um, how much of a dominating position Capablanca got because of the space that he was able to enjoy in the middle game. So like he started out as a fairly innocuous opening, Bishop G5 was played. He responded Bishop E7. It's not a, it's not the most popular continuation, but it's it's fairly solid. I mean, if you played uh, a number of times by grandmasters, and it's fairly solid, although not the most active position for Black. Fight continue 9 bd 2 Black played F5, strengthening his control over the E4 square. His knight wants to jump in here. Yeah. White responded e3, knight e7, bishop d3, knight h6, castles, castles, queen c2, g6. Now, you can try and take a few moments to try and assess this position, see which imbalances you think are most important. And if you want to do so, you can pause the video. Um, if you are lazy like me and you don't want to do any analysis at all, it's the space in the center here, the central four squares. It's it's fairly equal, yeah. White controls the D um, four and then the E five squares, and then black conversely controls the D, D five and then the E four squares. Um, so the, the the central space is fairly equal. Over on the king side, black actually enjoys slightly more space, yeah, than white. But then it's also the side with the king, so. The more space you, I mean, you can you can't push his pawns here too much because they simply explode his king. So automatically, Capablanca realizes that space on the queen side in this game would be much more relevant. And it's also the the side of the board where he has a slight space advantage. It's very slight. You may miss it if you're not uh, careful. Yeah, the, the pawns on the D file have both advanced equally, but then on the C file it's not the case. White has a pawn on C4. Black C pawn is on C6, and I mean, it's going to remain there for, for a while. And that's slight difference in space. Um, 
is is going to tell. So Capablanca played rook a b1, a move that is really a statement of intent. It's a move that's preparing the push b4, meaning he fully intends to push all the pawns on this queen side and gain as much space as possible. Black responded knight f6, trying to plant his knights in the center. Knight e5, knight f7, f4, bishop d7, knight e f3, rook f d8. Now, the preparations are finally complete here. Yeah, the, the center is is locked down. The pawns are all staring at each other in this stone wall formation. There are no pawn breaks here in the center. So the game automatically switches to the flanks. Now, the king side is not the side of the board you really want to push pawns on too quickly or too um, um, in such a carefree manner because you might get your king just mated. So automatically the queen side becomes the the hub of attention, and this is where white already enjoys some advantage. So his whole idea of pushing f and locking down the center was just to make emphasize his, his queen side superiority and now he, he starts really showing this with the move before black response with bishop e8 opening up the d file for for his rook rook fc1 again the rook can now leave the king side and come and join the other pieces here on the queen side because that's where the, the action is basically going to going to occur now Black really wishes he could open up the center and then switch the attention of the game from the screen side. But then he can't do that easily. Whenever he takes D takes C4, Bishop takes C4, the weakness here on E6 is just going to lose him the game fairly quickly. So he's stuck with a stuck center and a worse queen side, which makes the game very difficult for him to play. He responded A6 trying to lose um, White's pushing. White played queen of two. The knight took on e5, the knight took back, and he played knight e7. And here, Capablanca applied the first principle that we talked about with a side with more space. He avoided the exchange. Black would love to exchange off all the pieces. If all these pieces come off, his face disadvantage is not so important anymore. I mean, you have your bricks, and white is probably still. Slightly or significantly better, but then it's not as as pronounced as if the pieces are still on the board. So he brought the knight back, knight f3, and now this knight is a problem. This bishop is a problem. Can you think of finding squares for these pieces? I mean, with this pawn structure, with all his pawns on 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 the light squares, this bishop is just absolutely horrible. So he wouldn't even have been too mistaken in exchanging the the knight and again a good bishop versus bad bishop. But then the knight itself is not super great either. It can currently come um, through f6 to e4, which is probably what it should have done. But it's going to do something very funny that you'll see very soon and also be in a lot of trouble. Black played rook d to c8, realizing now that there's no point having the rook on the d file, it can't open it up. He tries to fight against black and white queen side space here. c5, grabbing more space, locking down the queen side learning to break with a4 and b5 white really has all the chips in this position black basically has no plan he's just waiting sitting and waiting knight f6 a4 knight g4 which i thought was weird um possibly he didn't want to come to e4 because white could just capture with his um, with his bishop the pawn would take back and his knight would land on the e5 square now unopposed having a very very good knight and playing against a very very horrible bishop and so he avoided that exchange and came to g4 but that wasn't much better queen e1 and now a simple h3 is coming to ask the knight what it's doing so the knight preemptively went to h6 again not a much better square capablanca calmly played h3 either ways just to control the knight and ask, ask him what what really are you doing here on h6 the knight came back to f7 g4 grabbing more king side space as well and this is why this game really stands out capablanca very skillfully grabbed space all over the board and very soon you see he basically controlled the, the entire board black was stuck in a shell 
it's difficult to find moves for black here i mean his black square bishop is so very bad and now the knight is also just horrible there are no outposts for it to land on it can't even come back to um, to if if for any longer the answer squares if for our very soon going to be blocked black played bishop d7 rook c2 king h8 rook g2 now he's planning to possibly open up the king side in a favorable position the rook tried to defend on g8 and then he locked the king side through down with g5 of course not um, permanently he has the only break in the position with h3 h4 h5 and black again just has to sit and wait so now he's threatening both to break here and here on d5 black has to figure out ways to defend both these threats with these passive horrible pieces queen d8 h4 was played king is 7 the king doesn't want to stay here after h5 he can open up the h file after doubling or tripling his major pieces here on the file and the king staying on h8 will just be a whole lot of trouble so the king attempts to run into the center h5 was played rook h8 trying to fight against the open file rook h2 queen c7 queen c3 now notice how because he has more space white has very nice piece and um, squares for his pieces yeah and then black doesn't have any square basically no square at all for either this knight or this bishop to land on and affect the game in any way they're both just dead for the rest of the game whereas white has all the time in the world because black basically has no plan to maneuver reposition his pieces on the ideal squares before he breaks he controls more space both on the king side and the queen side and he's going to emphasize that even more queen d8 king f2 getting the skin off of these files preparing to break his rook to join the action here on the king side queen c7 black can only sit and wait rook to h1 rook a g8 to try to fight against the king side pressure and this is really what you want to do when you have this advantage in space it's also um, um, a use of the idea of two weaknesses here there's already he already has pressure here on the queen side with the threat of the push b5 and now he also has pressure here on the king side with the threat of both pushing h6 or taking at some opportune time and killing black on, on the open file now one or two of these ideas maybe it's possible to defend but all of them it's simply impossible and when you stretch your opponent's resources so much that they have to commit to defending against one of your ideas you can quickly switch to the other and completely crush them which is what happens here so eventually you realize he's going to win rather on this a file that black has been forced to neglect because he has to defend here on the king side white plays queen a1 rook b8 trying to do both queen a3 rook returns to g8 just has to wait and now b5 a takes b5 and then h6 locking down the king side he's no longer planning to take here and make use of the h file but he's rather going to very quickly remaneuver all of his pieces here onto the a file and you realize that black simply does not have the space to respond in kind and he's going to lose here on the queen side so the king went to f8 a takes b5 king attempted to run to e7 b6 queen b8 rook a1 Rook c8, queen b4, getting the queen off the file, planning um, to double rook to d8. And you notice that black simply does not have the space to respond. He would really love to get his queen somewhere off behind here so he can play rook to a1 and just exchange all the major pieces. But he simply does not control any square to pivot his queen on. The rook jumps into the position, rook e7 king of eight now the king wants to stay here and indeed now that the king side is locked safer here but then he's completely losing here on the queen side rook h1 can slowly maneuver all his major pieces onto this file bishop e8 and black is helpless rook h a1 king g8 rook on to a4 forming the so-called iakin's gun king of eight completing it with queen a3 king g8 black can do nothing but sit and wait now again he has all the time in the world to find out the ideal placement of all his pieces to break through black's position 
and it does just a bunch of moves here king g3, bishop d7, king h4, king h8, queen a1, king g8, king g3, king f8, king g2, bishop e8. And now finally, he comes up with a plan to end the game once and for all. You can again pause the position, the game, the video here, sorry, and try and figure out where the weakest point in black's camp is where white can break through. White can reposition all his pieces to target this particular square, and black is helpless to defend against it. Okay, so I hope you figured it out. Capablanca certainly did, and the weakest square here is this B7 pawn. It's already attacked once and only defended once, and he's going to reposition his knights through D2 to B3 to A5 to attack the pawn again. He's going to be able to bring the bishop here to attack the pawn once again, once black is forced to defend, defend it with some sort of pin. And all those three pieces attacking the pawn, it's simply impossible for black to defend with as many pieces. The rook first of all doesn't have this square, so this rook is the only one that can defend. The knight can't defend, the bishop can't defend. He has no squares under his control. Knight d2. Just emphasizing how horrible his position is. Bishop d7. Knight b3. Rook e7. To attempt to bring the rook to a point where he can defend that pawn. Knight e5. Knight d8. Then bishop a6 overloading the pawn no way of bringing another piece into its defense so he's just going to lose the pawn if he doesn't take so he's forced to take white takes his bishop and this is certainly not, not an exchange this pawn is going to fall this pawn is going to fall it's going to have two connected passes that are just the game is completely won bishop then rookie seven to attempt to exchange the pieces of but now he falls from tactic Rook takes d8, check. Rook takes d8. Knight e6 with the fork of all the major pieces. Completely winning the game. Winning another pawn. A third pawn will fall here on a6. Um, he has two extra advanced pass pawns. I mean, black resigned here, obviously. The game might have continued something like uh, queen c8, takes, takes, takes. Threatening this to win the queen as well. So maybe the king has to step up. Then rook a8, the pin has to go away, then something like rook h8, then need to take yet another pawn with disastrous consequences, threatening to lay his rook in the queen into the position somewhere, push both of these two pawns. I mean, he's losing all over, and so black resigned. So I hope you took note of how Capablanca made use of the principles that you've talked about. First, he avoided unnecessary trades when the knight exchange was offered him. Then he con continued to gain space on the queen side when the center was locked. And then he made use of the principle of two weaknesses. Calmly taking space on both sides of the board, making weaknesses on both sides, stretching black's defenses too thin. And when black could not defend against his attack on the queen side, he stretched all his pieces there quickly and overwhelmed black. And this is a model game. I mean, all the space that fights controlled in this game was, was simply amazing and that's what makes it so popular so um, hopefully you can make use of these principles when you have the space advantage in your games now we'll quickly look at the second game which is how to play when you're on the side that is playing against the space advantage we'll look at it from black's perspective since coach uh, 9 was black here so this is so coach 9 playing black against a player called I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that, it's spelled C-S-O-R-N, so pronounce it however you wish. Now, Kochner was black, he played d4, Kochner responded with the King's Indian setup. And already white started playing some weird moves. I mean, there are many moves for white to play here, knight c3, the bishop can come out anywhere, basically, this knight can come out, there, there are many moves. But d5 is not one of them. For one thing, you know black wants to put his bishop here, and so you're already opening up a beautiful diagonal for the bishop. Although you are grabbing space, you are leaving a lot of things behind. It's unnecessary and it's far too premature. So, black calmly continued, bishop g7, knight c3, castled e4, grabbing space. In this game, I want you to note how, I mean, white basically plays like a space machine. He grabbed space at every possible opportunity. 
and it it's it helps us because it demonstrated very well the the disadvantage of having too much space here. Yeah? The space you leave behind. D6, of course, you don't want him to play e5. Bishop e2, c6, bishop e3, a6. This is a common plan in playing the, these king, the kings against structures. You play a6 and then b5 to fight against and white pawn, and central pawn. Now, because black was planning to play b5 and he knew this, white decided to stop this with a5, a4, sorry. Stopping the b5 idea and then also grabbing more queen side space. But I remember one of the problems with being the side with the space is that you leave squares behind. Now, with the move a4, can you figure out the square that black has permanently lost control over? There are two of them. And obviously, those are the, the b3 and the b4 squares. And then black immediately plays to emphasize this with his next move a5. Creating an outpost here on b4, also creating space on a6. He plans simply to put pivot his knight to a6 to b4. And ask you why you are giving me so many knights outposts in your camp. Also, the move a5 by securing b4 also secures the square c5, also has another outpost because it's this pawn can never come in to protect against the square. So, you're always careful in grabbing space. Yeah, this was a4 was premature d5 was premature and then he continues with more space grabbing moves g4 continue can we please 96 f4 it's it's amazing going through this i mean white was just grabbing i mean if if chess was determined purely by who has more space you'd have crashed <laughs> crashed continue here but again continue calmly understood the backdrop of having space and to so played knight d7 now he plans to put this knight here on c5, the other knight here on b4, two beautiful pieces. He already has a wonderful diagonal here for his dark square bishop. And it's difficult to see what white is doing with all this piece here. But that didn't stop white though, he continued with h4. And when you're a beginner, it's very easy to look at this position and think maybe white is better. I mean, he, he has so many advanced points, he's pushing them. But then, any expert I will quickly spot that he's also leaving a lot of squares behind that he cannot defend and these squares are going to lead to him losing the game so the first knight comes here to c5 and already they are threatening the position like he's threatening bishop takes c3 check pawn takes and then this e4 square is going to be hungry and that's the problem with all these pushes you wish you could play a move like f3 here to secure this pawn but you can't you've already moved the pawn so we are forced to play bishop f3 but then bishop f3 also loses control of yet another point that white can, black can attack the c4 pawn and he goes about doing this first with the move queen b6 hitting the weak pawn on b2 now you can't defend the pawn with normal means that you i mean first of all you can't advance it because you lose this knight with very game ending consequences here. Yeah. Um, certain moves that you, you want to play um, that would simply defend the pawn like something simple like rook um, and b1 would lose to queen b4 which is a double attack making use of the pawn that you just let go of attacking the c4 pawn and also adding at another attacker to the c3 knight so threatening to take here twice and then also threatening the pawn and the fuck that's also is game ended. In addition to many other threats, I mean, this pawn could be increased in many lines. There are just so many weaknesses to target because of all these advanced pawns. And so, um, White decided to try to be tricky to defend the pawn with this move, Queen B2. Now, this is the tactic that he saw. That also happened in the game. White can, and Black can take on B2, Queen takes back, and then Black plays Knight D3 check in D2 and then takes the Queen back. White had seen this. White, however, thought that after this sequence, there was a, a tactic that he had. You can try and pause the video and find it. Also, don't look on the right side where the answer is. Um, but then there was something wrong with, with, with his calculations, and he was in fact simply losing the pawn for nothing. So, Black indeed took the queen, took back knight d3, queen d2, knight takes b2. And this was um, White's idea to play bishop e2 
arguing that this knight is completely trapped and he's going to simply win it with you know, any any sequence of moves that attacks the knight and on on face value i mean at first glance it looks like maybe he's right but then Kochner had already seen the the flaw in this in this little plan again because of all these advanced pawns all of these squares basically are not controlled by are not supported by pawns and pawns need to support pawns all of these pawns could be weak in many scenarios and one of them is weak here bishop takes g4 yeah this move probably is worth an exclamation and double exclamation the point being of course that you can't take it back simply because after knight c4 check there's an attack here on this knight this was an attack here on this bishop and the king is overworked defending both of them so the king would go somewhere and then you just take the easy, easy knight if takes back then the pawn hangs if the oh yeah basically so after bishop takes g4 white resigned the position was completely lost he had lost two pawns and everything is fine he still has a lot of things to, to, to deal with i mean there's still this diagonal and basically what i want you to take from this is how much trouble white got into because of just wanting a season space without any without proper preparation in the previous game with Capablanca, you saw how he prepared all the space grabs that he made made sure he locked the center before he grabs space on the queen side made sure he had prepared his pieces behind the pawns before he pushed them but then in this game why just push pawns for pushing sake and the weaknesses that they left behind proved decisive so we'll go over the principles again with the space advantage you want to avoid exchanges keep your opponent's position cramped um, identify ideal squares for your pieces make your pieces better than the opponent which is easier to do when you control more of the board and then when you have all your pieces on the ideal squares look at the weakness in your opponent's come that you can attack that simply cannot be defended and do that you also keep in mind the principle of two weaknesses like we saw a couple blanket demonstrate in the first game when you're playing against the weakness you want to exchange pieces if possible to reduce your current position you want to identify the weaknesses that the opponent has left behind as a result of the space that he controls and you look for some of these pawn breaks that will take advantage of these weaknesses okay so that is a uh, it for a primer on space and how to make use of it in your games i hope you enjoyed it learned something our next video will be on um, either the minor pieces or an introduction to pawn structure i haven't decided yet but those are the two that will make to complete the middle game series and then hopefully we'll go on to either an end game series or a series on pawn structure we'll see so thank you very much for tuning in happy chessing see you later